Laura has done a couple of previous talks for us, and I'm very excited to hear this one. Laura is a paleontologist and the University of Wyoming Geological Museum and Collections Manager. Her undergrad degree is from the University of Wyoming. Her PhD is from the University of Minnesota. She's been working there for eight years, helping to uh, basically digitize Wyoming's amazing fossil record. I swear I'm not responsible for this. Uh, she also researches how microbes play a role in the fossil, fossilization of bones. Okay, we're good. Please, please join me in welcoming Laura Vietta here tonight. Okay, I think we got the issue, which was this one providing feedback to this one. So I'm just gonna talk really loud. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Okay, yell if, if you can't. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna just go ahead and screen share my presentation. Oops, no, not like that. So uh, this is your first meeting in public. This is also my first presentation in public as well. So it's, it's a little bit of both of ours. Sorry. Okay, can Zoom World see this? No, we're our, your screen is frozen. Okay. Let's go to Zoom. Share screen. Share. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's um okay success <laughs> okay so uh, again my name is Dr. Laura Vietti and today I'm going to talk about one of Wyoming's soon to be most famous tapers if it hasn't um, if it isn't already and so again I am I am not a taper expert I am a taphonomist which is literally how things um, the death and decay of fossils and the, the preservation of fossils but uh, thanks to Rick Hebden and his crew we had this amazing specimen show up at the Wyoming Geological Survey not the museum the survey which opened up a whole bunch of really exciting um, research avenues. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Uh, and again, it's, it's mostly just to inspire and, and really uh, celebrate you know, the, the collectors that found this as well as the state of Wyoming and how amazing our fossils are in Wyoming. So I run the University of Wyoming Geological Museum. This is in Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, the top is what we look like on the outside and then this is what we look like in the inside. If you haven't been to the University of Wyoming, please, please come, we're free. It's a small museum, but we have quite a bit of stuff, including uh, at one time Wyoming's only dinosaur mount, although we have several more since then. So the object of this entire talk is this specimen right here. And um, I'm basically gonna lead you guys through what a paleontologist would do to try and identify it and figure out what, how and why it ended up in the Green River Formation out near Kemmerer, Wyoming. So this specimen, uh, <laughs> this specimen has been shown uh, a couple of places. So it was first shown at the, um, the what's it called, the, the Wyoming State Museum. And then again, it, it made a trip to Kemmerer, Wyoming at the Fossil Butte National Monument. It is not publicly available to see right now. And that's, that's for a couple of reasons, which I'll, I'll share here in a bit. So a little bit about the discovery of this incredible specimen. So <laughs> thankfully we have the, the discoverer here. Uh, so it was discovered by Rick Hepton in 2016. And um, he found it at one of his quarries that he leases from the state, um, the, the state land. And the specimen comes from the Green River Formation, the Fossil Butte member, I believe. And uh, it's about 
50 to 52 million years old. And we'll go into the depositional environment and what, it, what the, the environment of the time that the, the animal lived. And so the time scale here on the left, that is the geologic time period of, of, of life. The uh, green to orange transition, just a little bit below that arrow, is when dinosaurs went extinct. And so starting in the Cenozoic or that orange layer up there, that's when mammals really started to take off and fill a whole bunch of unique niches that were previously occupied by dinosaurs. And so uh, the specimen and all the specimens that come from the Green River Formation are really important because not only are they well-preserved, but they also document some of the early fauna from after the dinosaurs went extinct. So just a little bit about uh, Rick's quarry. So Rick invited myself and a group of students up to visit his quarry uh, last summer. And so we did a, a famous night dig, which I've never been able to do. And so this is myself and uh, my teammates. Most of them are students at the University of Wyoming. And uh, here, we, uh, while we were waiting for it to get dark, we were able to excavate a whole bunch of, of incredibly preserved bugs in the rocks. And so that's what we're holding up there. And um, in the evening, we went, uh, basically Rick showed us how to, how you guys, how Rick excavates or um, quarries these large fossil, fossil slabs. And so um, this picture down here shows Matt Hames who uh, filmed Rick and, uh, and the crew and ourselves. And he created this amazing documentary, a PBS special uh, for Wyoming and it's called Fossil Country. So this is what it would look like if you were to click the link. It's free, anybody can go see it. I just watched it this morning. <laughs> And if you guys have a cell phone, I encourage you to snap this photo right here. This is a QR code that will take you directly to that video. Um, it's 45 minutes long. And again, it's, it's a really interesting, really good video highlighting um, many unique aspects about Wyoming paleontology and especially the, the Green River Formation in Kemmer. So let's go back to the fossil. So Rick and his crew found uh, quite a few slabs of um, this really big animal, and it wasn't a fish, which was the first kind of indicator that there was something special about it. Uh, and as soon as, Rick, sorry, Rick, I keep speaking for you, but um, this is all via Rick's uh, in, um, conversation with me. But as soon as they discovered and they saw that it was had big bones, they pretty much stopped all fine exploration and they tried to pull it out of the ground in large slabs to protect and preserve the bones. This is what the slabs look like after fossil preparation, and I'll go more into that later. I was able to kind of put the slabs together, and this more or less is what the animal would have looked like. Unfortunately, the skull, most of the skull was lost, um, and in fact, that's how the animal was found, was um, the skull weathering, or, or basically they, they found the skull first, which <laughs> kind of meant that it was lost. But it would have belonged to an animal that looked a skeleton a little bit like this, and we think it might have looked something like this in real life. Again, a very cartoon representation of what we think. And, and the reason we think this, I'll go over here in a bit. So the talk outline is going to be, um, I'm gonna talk about the origins and the evolution of taper. I'm gonna talk about tapers today because prior to this fossil being discovered, I really didn't know much about tapers. And I suspect a lot of um, folks here might also not as well. So I think it's a really, it's a really interesting group of animal. Uh, we're going to talk about the life and environment at the time that this taper was alive. We're going to talk about the death and decay, which is my favorite subject. We're going to talk about preservation, discovery, preparation, and then I'm going to finish with what is next. So the first question, we have the skeleton, but we want to know what it is. And so I'm basically going to lead you guys how we identified it. Um, at least somebody like me, somebody who is a, an expert in hoofed mammals or ungulates probably would look at this and immediately know what it is. I didn't, so it took me some, some work. So first off, we know it's a mammal. The skeleton, the, the orientation, it, it's not a dinosaur, it's not a lizard, it's a mammal. So that can narrow us down into the field of mammals. But mammals are vast. These are all modern, uh, modern groups of mammals. And so the next trick is to figure out which type of mammal. And to do that, uh, well, not yet. We can pretty much say that we know it belongs into the ungulates. So those are the hoofed mammals. At the time though, hoofed mammals didn't really exist. They were just the predecessors to hoofed mammals. 
But based on the, the general um, length of the legs and the body uh, skeleton design, we knew it was going to be some sort of a, a ungulate. So the next question is which type of ungulate? So these are all different types of hoofed mammals. Again, their ancestors didn't have hoofs like we know today, but um, these are all of the hoofed mammals that exist today and in the past or the major groups. So which one did the skeleton belong to? And the next thing we do is we look at clues on the skeleton to narrow us down into which group. And to do that, we were very fortunate in that the, um, the, the pedal elements, the foot elements of this specimen were very well preserved. And so we were able to look at these feet to determine which major group of mammal it belonged to. And so um, again, these are the back limb elements that we're going to use. I've outlined in red on the skeleton where they would have been. And there are generally two types of ungulates. Um, there's perissodactyls and there's artiodactyls. Perissodactyls here on the left are odd toed. And um, that means that they have odd toes and on the hind limb, not the front limb. And then on the right, we have artiodactyla and that's even toed. And so they have two uh, or four. And one really easy way for you guys to, to, um, to kind of tell the difference is that if you're ever hiking on a trail and you see like a deer print, you have two halves to it. That means that it's going to have two toes, which puts it in the artiodactyl category. Whereas if you find a horse, um, it's going to only have that one major circle. And so that puts it in the single toed category, which is an odd toed. So it's a really simple way just by looking at footprints um, to tell the difference between perissodactyl and artiodactyl. So what we can do is look at the skeleton and look at these back toes and we have one, two, three, which puts it very solidly in the perissodactyl group. Excellent. So now we know that it is a perissodactyl. <laughs> the question though is what type of perissodactyl? So the group of perissodactyls includes horses, rhinos, tapers, um, these extinct animals called calicotheres, which were pretty amazing. That's the very top image. Those were the biggest land mammals ever on, on planet Earth, belong to the, the, the calicothere group. So again, the question is, which of these groups did that fossil belong to? And for that, we're going to zoom into the, um, the jaw so that we're going to look at the teeth. So what I've shown here uh, we did find, thanks to careful collection, there was one tooth that was um, part of the skeleton. And in fact, the entire bottom row of teeth are still in that, that specimen, but the preparator chose to keep them covered because they are incredibly fragile. And so we can use other techniques to study them. We don't need to, to expose them. But we had this one tooth at the, the time of discovery, and it was, a, um, it was a, an upper molar. So kind of where I've highlighted there in red. So we can use this tooth to further identify which type of artiodactyl it was. So here's the tooth. Uh, here I've shown a, a elevation map. So I have a, a really nice digital microscope in my collection and it takes a 3D model of any specimen. And you can see the, the red equals high points and the, the cooler colors equal low points. And here I put the main groups of artiodactyls. And here I've put the teeth. And these are all the same type of, of upper molar that this tooth would be. And so um, again, it's, it's, it's to a, an untrained eye, they all kind of look the same, which I first thought. <laughs> but when you start delving in into looking particularly at the peaks and troughs of these teeth, and then the overall shape, it clearly lies within one group. And that is the tapers. So this, um, the blue one, the second down. And if you look at that tooth design from those on the actual fossil, you'll notice that there's quite a few similarities, but they're not perfect. So, you know, it's probably a taper, but we don't think it's an actual taper. It's a taperoid or some type of taper, but we can't, we don't think we can firmly put it in the taper group quite yet. So that's about as good as we can get at my level. So um, we know again, based on the elements and the tooth that it likely belongs in this taper category. And it's part of this taperoidia or taper, taper day maybe 
but we don't really know where it lies within that group yet. Um, it'll take an expert to really look at the skeleton and look at the teeth and compare it with others to narrow it down to exactly what it is or perhaps um, describe a new species. Again, that's, that's out of my wheelhouse. So now I'm gonna delve into tapers today because they are a really engaging, lovely group of animals that I had no idea about. So just general characteristics of tapers. There are, they are about three to 700 pounds. They have a very thick hide and tapers today have this really cool prehensile tail, uh, nose. And so it's not quite like an elephant. It's like a really short version, but it can move up and down. I have a video. Uh, so, okay, so here is a video. These are some tapers. Um, there's no sound, but it's a, it's a fun video that kind of shows the adorable babies. <laughs> but you can even see that, that um, prehensile nose. Obviously, I really like this guy. Um, <laughs> uh, so here they are. They are browsers, meaning that they typically live in jungles and they eat jungle like fruits and um, and and leaves. They're not. They do not eat grasses. <laughs> Here's one in Central America that found a new home. But here is interesting, you can see the general size of this taper, it's a little bit smaller. But you can look at the feet and you see those individual pads. Uh, again, here it is uh, indicating what it eats today. So again, dense jungle, lots of leaves and fruit. I think, oh, this one actually had it. <laughs> there is sound, but it's, it's, it's got this really fun call. So a little bit more about tapers. They only have one baby at a time. Their pregnancy lasts up to 14 months and they stay with their mother for up to 16 months, says Wikipedia. Um, habitat, lowland or montane rainforest, rainforest being the key. They are tropical and uh, interestingly, they are important seed dispersers. So they eat fruit and as they poop, they disperse these fruit all over the, the jungle floor. And so that's one of the, the um, really important ecosystem components that they bring. There are only four to five species today and they exist in Central and South America. And then there's one in the Southeast. So the, the first one is Baird's taper and this one lives uh, in Central America. We have the mountain taper, which lives in South America in Ecuador and Colombia. We have the lowland taper, which is um, Amazon rainforest. And then we have the Malayan taper, which um, as you can see is from Mal Mal Malaysia. So that's the only one that's not on the um, central or South America. Unfortunately, tapers are quite threatened. Um, so they are uh, targeted for hunting. They are also threatened because of fragmentation and loss. So the photograph I have on the right is the rainforest showing the deforestation and the development of developments. Uh, so they're losing their habitat. All four species are declining and three are endangered. So uh, let's see, the, the Malay taper is down to 2,500 individuals, says the internet. So they are, are quite threatened today. But we had one in the Eocene. So here's our Eocene and potentially what he, he would have looked like or she would have looked like. And here's a modern taper. And so the question is, what would have been similar to tapers today and what would have been different um, from the Eocene from tapers today? Similarity, based on the skeleton, they probably had a pretty similar body shape. Their feet formula indicate that they were also quite comparable. Uh, again, with the, the actually four toes in front and then the three toes in the back. Uh, based on the teeth and just general um, body shape, we think they probably had a very similar diet and habitat to the, the fossils compared to the modern. However, the difference is, we think that the size, well, we know that the size is very different. The taper that we found in the fossil record, or Rick found, it would have been a, a, a dog sized, whereas the tapers today are, are horse or um, small horse sized. This is a big discussion. Uh, it turns out in the paleo world, the 
the people who study early tapers are not convinced that they had a prehensile nose and they've looked at the skull shape and they don't think it's long enough or hollow enough to really have um, potentially that nose. So that's an interesting point that maybe this the specimen that uh, we're investigating today did not quite have that adorable nose. Uh, it also turns out the teeth morphology and the number of teeth are different. That's nothing unusual from our ancestors to today. Oh, and it has longer legs relative to tapers today. So what is a tropical taper doing in southeastern Wyoming? First, let's look at the origin of tapers. So I use something called the paleobiology database. It is an incredible resource that's free and anybody can access. And I've actually put together a little bit of a demo on how I looked at the origin and distribution of fossil tapers, because I think it's really interesting and it's, it's available to anyone, including you know, school kids doing science fair projects or anybody wanting to find uh, you know, where a bell and night is in Wyoming. So this is a video and is it, is it a video? Yes. So I've entered into the paleobiology database and I'm writing in the word tape, taper, taperoidia, and every dot that shows up on the map is a fossil taper that has been published. And you can see there's different colors and those colors correspond to different time periods down here on the geologic time scale. So I click paleogene, which is the early Eocene, and you can see the dots, well, in the Paleocene right after dinosaurs went extinct, there are no tapers. In the Eocene, tapers appear all across the globe. And then into the Oligocene and Miocene, there are more tapers, different places. So it's really useful tool for looking at where these fossils exist at different time periods all throughout the globe. Now, if we zoom in, uh oh, I don't know what I'm trying to do here. Um, <laughs> so it's showing that tapers even existed very far north. And then there's still quite a few in um, Eurasia, which I'm going to go into a little bit more here. So if we zoom into Wyoming, Rocky Mountain West, these are all the Eocene taper occurrences. And you'll notice we do have quite a few in southeastern Wyoming, um, as well as in northern. Okay, I think that might be it for my slideshow. Yeah. So as you can see, though, it's it's a really powerful tool, um, and again, you guys can do this for any fossil that you're curious about. No, no, they're found all across the globe. Oh, um. It depends on the time period. So the Miocene time period, they were found um, in Florida and the East Coast, but for this specific time period, they are only found in the Rocky Mountain West. So, um, okay, that's just the video again. So the implications of looking at that diagram, the, 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 the literature suggests that tapers first originated in, um, in Europe, and they spread out along the, um, and then they distributed laterally. So they went across the Alaska um, land bridge. It's a different land bridge than like the, the Pleistocene one. Um, and then they populated all the way down to the south. That is the current idea of how tapers originated and then distributed. However, this is a lineage of Perissodactyla. And so here on the very top, you see we have rhinocera, rhinoceros and taper. Oh, these are the groups. And this red bar indicates the time period of the Green River formation that this taper, taperoid specimen was found. And you notice it's to the left of that diversion of the, the, um, the time that Rhinocera and Taperidae diverged. Bear with me. So what it means is that here's when we think Rhinoceros and Taper diverged, however, because we think we have a taper more to peer more for taper day specimen, it pushes that divergence further back in time. What that means is that unlike we, what we thought before, tapers might have originated in the US and then spread outward from here. So it's a little bit of a different interpretation with some pretty important implications. And again, it's just because that boundary had to be pushed back making our taper taper morph, it's not quite a taper, um, one of the earliest tapers in the world. So 
I talked to Luke Holbrook, which is a, um, a really good paleontologist who studies fossil mammals, especially ungulates. And it turns out that that's probably not the case. He, he firmly believes that they originated in Asia or Eurasia. And so what we also think is it's possible that even though we see that this, this diversion between rhinoceridae and tapiridae is further back than we thought, it probably could also mean that the whole group needs to be just pushed back. And so this model of starting in Europe and spreading to the Americas afterward still has validity. So I, I like the other version, but experts show that um, this is probably the one, but we don't know for sure. It needs further study. So let's talk about the, the significance. So I'm basically gonna summarize what I just went over. Number one, the age indicates that tapers may have originated in Americas and backflowed into Asian Europe. Again, this is an opposite uh, theory than, than the current literature suggests, but that's, that's a little arm wavy, possibly not. We do know though, based on the single tooth, that the age indicate the age and then the morphology, meaning the shape of the tooth, which does not match other teeth of that group, probably indicates that this specimen belongs to something else. And so it has, it has potential to be a different genus or species. And then lastly, among others, uh, this is the largest mammal to be recovered from the fossil lake deposits. It's pretty cool. Okay, so again, though, we have a tropical taper. We know that it, it evolved and spread to here or evolved here and spread out. But the question is, what is a tropical taper doing into in right now a very snowy, cold Wyoming? And um, there he is. Uh oh, okay. So that's where we go to um, the rocks that it was found in. So this is an example of one of the quarries down at, at Fossil Basin. And this is not the quarry that the specimen was found in, but it shows a type of rock, um, which is this carbonate shale. We can use clues from this shale to tell us what the environment was like. And so again, this, this belongs to Fossil Lake, which is, oops, which is highlighted there in that, um, that red circle. And it is this early Eocene um, specimen. And so there was a large lake at the time at, in southeastern Wyoming. And we can tell based on other animals that were found in the, the strata, like crocodiles, turtles, freshwater stingrays, that this environment was warm. Uh, we find a whole bunch of plants that you can only find in tropical or warm, wet environments. And so just from these alone, we know that Wyoming at the early Eocene was a very lush, tropical, warm environment. We also look at temperature reconstructions. And so this is a very famous Zacos curve where they, use, um, where they use isotopes. I won't get into it, but they use isotopes to, um, to back calculate the temperature at different times over um, Earth's history. And so this side, the left-hand side is um, old, and then the right-hand side is to today. So we go from left to right, older to younger. And the, uh, the line indicates the temperature in Celsius. So here I've highlighted a range. That's when the Green River formation was likely deposited. Um, we are still narrowing down those dates and that's something that um, my colleagues and I are actually working on and having some very good success on. But if you'll notice that that red bar intersects the, um, the global temperature when it's pretty warm. And if you um, back calculate out from, from Fahrenheit, sorry, from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it's about 80 degrees average temperature. So Wyoming 52 million years ago when this animal lived was 80 degrees. So that's what it was doing in Wyoming. So here's what a, a reconstruction of what a taper would have looked like in a tropical environment. So when you go to Kemmerer, Wyoming, um, and especially if you go up to those quarries, try and put this image in your head. And this is what the edge of the lake might have looked like. Um, this image is actually from a paper that studied a taper from Alaska. So uh, even Alaska was warm and tropical at this time period. Okay, so we've pretty much determined what a taper is doing in Wyoming. It had um, evolution or dispersion ties to Wyoming. 
it was warm, so we had the right environment for tapirs. The next question though, is a taper is a land mammal. What is it doing in sediment that was deposited at the middle of a lake? And this is pretty much where I really get excited because this is more my field of paleontology. And so again, I'm a taphonomist, which is pretty much CSI of paleontology. So here's our animal. This is our crime scene, as I like to call it. And the skeleton, and we can use evidence of this specimen to pretty much tell us a little bit about what it was doing in the middle of the lake, just by looking at the orientation um, and just the occurrence of it. So I'm gonna take you through uh, the, basically the life, death and preservation of the specimen, starting with life. So we have our taper amorph that was alive and then the animal had to die. When animals, especially large ungulates, die, they often bloat. And so here I have an example of a cow that's died. And you can see that it's quite distended. And that's from decay or some, from, uh, it's decay gas that accumulates in the stomach from natural microbes. And then it basically just kind of balloons up. If you've ever seen roadkill, like especially raccoons, they tend to look like that. So the animal died and then the animal bloated. And so it laid somewhere long enough in a quiet enough and it was not scavenged because it developed that decay gas in its, in its ca um, abdominal cavity. The next thing it did is it somehow got to the middle of this lake and there's a really common phenomenon called bloat and float. And so this is an example of a cow a carcass that is currently um, floating in the middle of a river in India. And so the bloat stage basically turns it into a balloon and it, it can travel very easily down a river or any body of water. And so it's a very good chance, I'm pretty certain that this animal, this, this taper that we've been looking at died, bloated, and then there was either a flash flood or it died naturally near a riverbank and somehow it got picked up by the river and this, um, this river deposited it to the lake where it then continued to float out to the middle of the lake. So it's bloated, floated, and then eventually you even saw the rib cage in the other one. Um, birds, just natural decay processes, will let go of that gas and it will sink. But we're not done. So the animal sunk, but you notice that the front half of the animal is in anatomical position, meaning that the leg bones connected to the arm bone, connected to the shoulder. Uh, it's in life, life um, orientation. But if you look at the back half of this animal, you'll notice that it's a jumble. It's associated, but they are not in life position. And this is a really good red flag for what happened to the animal next. It basically popped. And so it was brought down to the, the, the bottom of the, the lake and it either had decay gas still in it or more decay gas um, developed and especially indicated by, because it's on that hind end, uh, some sort of popping or exploding event caused those bones to disarticulate and be spread out. So that's what we think that probably happened to the specimen. There is possibility that a scavenger came by or just another animal, but the bottom of the lake was very, um, we think anoxic and not, uh, or yes, there wasn't a lot of oxygen or scavengers at the bottom of the lake. So it's likely that this happened from some sort of abiotic cause like the gas escaping violently. So to move on, the specimen was now buried and ultimately we had to use our amazing quarry operators and owners to um, discover and excavate the specimen. And so here I have a video of showing just, I just grabbed this from YouTube, showing what a, a, a typical quarry looks like um, in the sandwich beds. This is not the, the really thick units where a lot of the most beautiful specimens are found, uh, but a lot of incredible specimens are found this way. And I, I, I'm hoping to open the floor to Rick to tell us a little bit more about how we found it, because it's a little bit of a unique way he found it. And, and it was located in a part of the strata that you don't usually find specimens. But we had to find it. We have Rick and his crew to thank you for that. Um, and 
this was what he brought to the um, state. So he found a specimen on a um, on state land that he leases. And um, it's a very unique situation. Wyoming is the only state in the, the U United States that offers commercial collecting on state lands. And there's not, I think there's only three quarries that they do this, but the, um, the, the agreement is that the commercial collectors can collect, but anything that is deemed rare, they have to relinquish back to the state. And that's the idea that if they find something very important for, sci for scientific purposes, it enters into the public trust and the state of Wyoming gets to, um, it's, it's still held um, by the state. So unfortunately he found this on the state quarry, fortunate for us. Um, he had to, to bring it into the, you know, the um, Wyoming State Geological Survey. And this was what the, spec the, the part, the major bits looked like. Um, they're huge slabs. You can see where some bone is peeking out, but for the most part, it's covered. And that is a good thing because it means it's not destroyed. And from this point on, we hire, oh, this is the Wyoming State Geological Survey. I could go on and on about the very interesting relationship that the survey, the UW Geological Museum and the state, uh, shoot, Bureau, Bureau of Lands, I forgot what they're called. Uh, they have a, a really interesting relationship on how fossils are um, curated and managed. So, uh, sorry, this is a geology building on the left, and then the state survey is hidden over there in the trees on the right. So we're very close. So the next stage is the fossil preparation of the specimen. And the state survey, under the um, request of, of, a, of a special advisory board, hired Mike Eklund, a very good professional preparator. The specimen we knew was very important and very rare, and it had the potential for skin, stomach contents. Uh, there's a lot that could be there. And so we wanted to make sure that somebody who was skilled could prepare it. And so Mike Eklund was the, um, the one that was chosen. I think they put out a bid for it. I wasn't part of that process. But as part of the, um, the process of, of bidding, Mike promised to produce videos like this. And so this is Mike preparing the specimen uh, under a time lapse. And so you can see he's using like a little mini jackhammer or an air scribe and slowly um, showing the fossil. And he's doing all of this under a microscope. You can't see it, but he's actually looking through a microscope. I don't remember, it's been, it's been a couple years <laughs> since I've last given this talk. It's, it's hours and hours of prep work here. And so he's re revealing those very important feet. So I'm actually going faster than I thought. Um, here we are. So the, the specimen was prepared. And uh, there's a, a couple of just reasons why we didn't put it back into skeleton form we just partially prepared it. And that means that we left um, one side still in the matrix or the rock that it was found in. And we also uh, displayed it, as you can see here at the State Museum at the top. And here it was displayed at, the, um, at the, the Fossil Butte National Monument. The reason that it was prepared so, not coarsely, but it wasn't put into a big, beautiful, perfect skeleton was because we wanted to, to ensure the integrity of the data in that specimen. And so, we prepared it at the bare minimum so that when a researcher came along, they would have everything still intact to do the science on it. And so we didn't do the other side and we kept the blocks together so you could look at all, or sorry, separate so you could look at all angles of the specimen. So the question is, what's next with this? I am not a taper expert. It's not at the UW Geological Museum, but it is part of our as Wyomingites fossil. And there's a lot of exciting things that are gonna come from this specimen. So first off, we invited Professor Luke Holbrook, which is from the Rowan University at New Jersey, if I'm saying that right. Um, he came out pre-COVID and we invited him specifically to look at the specimen. And he confirmed it was a taper. Um, he also confirmed that it's something that he thinks is new. But without really looking at um, all sides of the specimen, looking at the teeth, 
he couldn't really much go much further than that in the couple of hours that he had with the specimen. <laughs> so, um, so, but we've been in, in contact with Luke, COVID is ending. And so we think that, uh, well, we know he's still interested and he's going to come back out and do the official study on the specimen. The second thing that's going to happen to the fate of the specimen is that the, um, the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne has pretty much requested that it be shown in there or displayed at their museum. And um, something really exciting about that museum is that they are currently undergoing um, the installation of a new fossil exhibit. And so they've closed off the, the current fossil area and they're putting in something new like this, this bottom reconstruction. And so I can't guarantee, but as far as I know, they are going to um, feature that taper for public to see at, um, at, the, at the State Museum. So that's, that's what I know about this taper. Um, I think it's, it's a really cool story. It can tell us a lot. And again, because we have people like Rick who find these specimens, but also the fact that it's a state specimen means that it's always gonna stay in Wyoming and it's gonna be available for everybody to look at as well as everybody if they want to, to study. So it's really one of our treasures that we should be really proud of as a state. So with that, thank you. Hi everybody. So this is our first time doing this obviously in the library and, and um, on Zoom. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to alternate questions on live and then on Zoom. So I'm Hey, we're hey just uh, can you stop the slideshow here, please? And okay. I'm going to try and orchestrate this. So do we have any questions here? Regarding the hidden elements Absolutely. Okay. So the question was regarding the hidden elements of the specimen, like the teeth or the other side of the bones. Can we use commute, um, computed tomography to, um, to, to look at them? And the answer is 100% yes. So the specimen has already been scanned on a CT scanner at the Ivinson Memorial Hospital in Laramie. And the reason they did that was first to see where the specimen was for preparation. Unfortunately, though, that medical grade scanner is only so good. And so it, it, it has a shape, we know where it is, but for fine details, it's not great. And so we need a micro CT to, to, to study it. However, these blocks, you know, are about a meter by a meter. And we are having a really hard time finding somebody willing to scan those on a micro CT. So it's going to happen, but we're it's a little bit of a roadblock right now. Yeah, so the, the, um, the suggestion was to look at oil and gas companies that often do similar um, type of studies on rock. No, I haven't. But the reason I haven't is because most of those scanners that I know of are for core. And it just gives you that very small, and I don't, but you're right, it's the right resolution. So it could get us narrowed into one part. I like it, thank you. So Brent, do we have any questions from the audience in Zoom? Yes, we do. Can you hear me? Yes, barely. Barely, okay. Uh, we have a question from Susan Marsh, and I'm gonna uh, let Susan unmute herself. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was just really interested in when you showed that global map of where the tapers were during the Eocene, okay. and they were sort of all over. And so I was wondering how, you know, I there were land bridges, but I didn't think the continents had moved that quickly, but maybe they do. I just um, thought it was interesting that uh, they seem to appear or migrate via land bridges at a time when it was warmer and you'd think there'd be smaller ice sheets? That's a very good point. And I wish I had a really good answer for you. Um, what I can say, so this is that map. Oh, that's that video. Let's see if I can go to another one. Um, well, 
there's a video. Uh, as far as I understood, by the Eocene, the continents were pretty much more or less how they look today, at least latitude wise, they're probably still spreading. Yeah. But the configuration was a little different and there was no ice at this time. So there was no, um, no ice, but the circum like North America and Africa or South America and Africa were still connected to um, Antarctica at that time. And yeah. so there was just enough connection between all the continents that I think they were able to distribute globally, but yeah. I'm not yeah. an expert in that category. Yeah, well, no, it's just, it was interesting. So I just wondered your cool. take on it. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I had a better, and I think somebody who's really good at this could, could answer that, not me. All right, um, can we have another Zoom question? Um, Brent? Uh, no, that's the only one I have so far. Okay, anybody else here that hasn't asked a question yet? Okay. Uh, so fossil life was very large. Uh, occupied a lot of southwest Wyoming. Do you have any sense of how deep it was? Oh, so the, the question was, is that Fossil Lake was really large um, and likely um, was also deep. Do we know how deep this lake was? I, I don't know. Rick, do you know? So I, I asked, um, Rick Hebden in the audience, and he said he also doesn't know, but some of the experts that really study the, the lake would. Um, but it's, from what I understand, based on this, um, like the 18 inch layer, it was very deep. It could not feel the, um, the waves. So if there was wind, um, it, it was deep enough that it wouldn't be affected by the waves. And it was deep enough that it had a thermocline or a, sorry, a chemocline. So there was no, uh, likely no scavengers or oxygen on the, sorry, I should be talking to you, on the bottom. So uh, I, I don't know, but deep. And I can look, look it up. Yes. Uh, can you come on up here? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna hand the microphone over to Rick. No, I I, I think you have to you have to be mic. So what do I do? I think just um, just hold it. Can you hear me good? Okay, so closer. <laughs> So in the 18 inch quarry, there's probably six productive layers. And at that time we were digging the uppermost, we call them, refer to it as the upper splits, just trying to get some commercial grade small fish to, to sell quickly, you know, you can get a lot of them up there. And I had three or four guys, small crew working up there all by hand. And one of them, had a shovel and he pulled it out and there was the part of the skull on the shovel. So it's like, whoa, 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 stop right now. So then we had to like uncover more of it, get down as close as we could, as carefully as we could. And that's when, like Laura said, it was all covered in bumps. All the bones were just big lumps. So then we, you know, we went as far as, chased the bone as far as it went. And then started to, I cut some of it with the cutoff saw and we get steel shims. They're like two inches wide, about 16th of an inch thick. And you'd slide them under there. You pound them with a the hammer a little bit and get it separated till we could slide it out because it's very, very fragile. Uh, that rock up there is. <clears throat> so we slide it out on a piece of plywood and then you can carry it safely took it down, put it in a container. You know, I keep all the stuff high and dry in. And the first thing I did was call Orvid, who's the supervisor at Fossil Butte National Monument, because we had something we didn't know what it was, but we knew it was not a fish <laughs> or any other. We knew it was mammal. So Orvid found the time, came over, and we, I showed it to him, and he was all excited. So then the next thing was just to wrap it up with the tinfoil. It was really good for holding everything in place because the edges were so soft and tape and plastic and 
from there we uh, later we was d doing a trip to the Denver show and stopped in Laramie and met the uh, crew there and handed it off to them. So. Oh, <laughs> so in that same quarry, the hard rock, the 18 inch layer, which is what we really go after. Again, it's all covered in bumps and it looks like a cement pad in the daytime. When the sun's shining, you can't see anything. It looks like cement, but what, at low angle light, as soon as the sun starts going down, the vertebrae and, and lumps throw shadows and you, oh, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So. We used to try and dig, you know, evenings, mornings and evenings. And then on a cloudy day, it throws a wrench. You can't, in, you got a crew standing around on a payroll, wasting time. And so I said, the hell with this, let's, let's we're gonna start digging at night. So that's what we do. And now you don't miss a thing. Everything just sticks out like the, a slab. There'll be 10,000 coprolites, the fish droppings plus all the fishes and everything else that's in there. You can see it, you don't miss it. So that's the way we dig down at night, that quarry. The other quarry, the split quarry, we dig in the daytime. So, <clears throat> yes. Uh, not very often, there's not that many things. There's, I found a few birds, a couple of turtles, that mammal. Um, I don't, can't remember if anything off the top of my head, but they're rare. It's very rare at best. Yeah. Uh, we cannot hear the, uh, questions coming over. We can hear your answers, but it's kind of a one-sided conversation. It's very hard to follow. He asked how often I, we, uh, find rare stuff, which I explained not very often. That's why they call it rare. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay, <clears throat> the gentleman asked what year I found it. I th was it 2016? I, I dates go past me like I don't even know anything about dates, but yeah, 2016. Then this other one I found, I know it was August in, do you remember the year? Two, it's been three years now. Yeah, Night, so 2019, 2018, 2018, okay. That's on the table there is a pamphlet of the newest, rarest thing we found. And it's, it's the most bizarre find I've ever came across. So it's uh, gonna fit, blend right in with this tape here. It might be some more of them. We don't even know that yet, but there's a bunch of them. There's a, probably, there might be tw as many as 20 skeletons in there. We, we have a question from the Zoom audience, if we can interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, yes. Uh, it'll be from Bruce. I'm trying to get Bruce to unmute. <laughs> uh, I think my question has already been answered. In the early 70s, I was rooting around in some beds near La Barge and found a fossil that I thought was a bird fossil. And I guess my question has been answered that do have people found bird fossils in that uh, fossil lake? I think my question has already been answered. Uh, that was a very good question. And I gotta tell you everybody, cause it's, it's remarkable. Fossil Lake is the most diversified fossil bird locality in the world. We've got over 35 different species catalog now, uh, you know, so that makes it the most diversified ever. Interesting. So, yes. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. <laughs> oh yes, how much the state pays me? It's quite the opposite. It's uh, I have to pay the state for the lease fee, and then I'm obligated to turn over any rare stuff, which I'm happy to do. <laughs> so we found a really nice bird with feathers. Candy did just last year. She was. 
oh, the library's closed, but we're still here. <laughs> no, she found, she was, I, we were all busy doing something and she was over in the tailings pile and looked at a, found a cross section of bone, brought it to me and I said, wow, it's hollow. That's gotta be a bird leg. So I said, gather up all the pieces. Uh, we'll take it home, look at it later. So we happened to have another bird from the split quarries and we was taking it down to x-ray it. And she said, can we get mine x-rayed too? And I said, I'd forgot about it. I said, what, what bird? And she, then she, anyway, we went and got it, took it down and wow, it was, it's a parrot. It's a pretty little parrot. X-ray is beautiful. And it's in the, that kind of rock oil shale. So it's likely to have feathers. So it's got to be one of those microscopic prepared jobs because you know the feathers fossilized feathers wow <laughs> go ahead I run the bird club will you come talk about it <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> any any others Okay, she, the lady asks uh, if there's similar fossils found around the world. And yes, there is uh, lots of different time represented though. Uh, like in Europe, there's the Solenhofen quarries. That's where Ramphorhynchus and, the, and the, the, yeah, Archaeopteryx, the little pterodactyls that come from. So, but that's much older. It's a Jurassic stuff, 120 million years old. Uh, France has little fossil fish. I've seen them in Australia. Brazil has them, but they're all different ages, you know. I think the only comparable place is Messel, Germany, and it's the exact same age. It's Eocene. It's, it's, they, we find almost identical stuff as they do at the same time period, but how, you know, halfway around the world apart. So, and then where else? There's fossil fish in Nevada, but they're just a you know few and far between and a, re a real young Miocene age I think um, there's a few scattered around but not not very many so yes oh, the gentleman asked that when I got interested since I was the day I was born when I used to go to school as a child you, the first day of school you get to see the you get all these new textbooks, right? And the first thing I did was plow through them and look for all the fossil pictures. So I could say I've had it, you know, an interest forever. And then fate, destiny, <laughs> took me there. So now I do it for a living. <laughs> I wish I, I tell people I wish that I got in the business of selling feathers instead of rocks because my. My back, my back and my knees would be in a lot better shape now. So, any others? Yes, we got it. Well, thank you. Oh, I, I just have one more plug. Um, so that PBS special, a lot of the questions that you guys just asked, especially about Rick and Corrine and nighttime, are all covered in that PBS special. And it's it's like it's called Fossil Country from. Um, Wyoming PBS. So I would definitely recommend checking it out because it has it has even more. All right. Well, thank you very much, Laura. This has been a real treat. And um, thanks to both audience live and on Zoom for uh, working with us through some of these <laughs> distractions. Let's just put it that way. Um, fantastic job, really. And uh, we have a, a thank you. <laughs> And we have a few little mementos um, from the geologists of Jackson Hole. <laughs> thank you. To say thank you for all your time and effort for driving all the way over here. So, um, mammoth tusk, or not mammoth tooth cross section. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brent, um, for managing the Zoom and being our Zoom Meister. And with that, I think we'll call it a. Oh, thank you. Yes. Sorry. As usual, please. Um, Please help us put the chairs back against the walls. And uh, thank you. Two weeks from now, we are gonna be back here in the library. If
<laughs> and we'll have another talk. Um, it's gonna, oh, it's gonna be Ron Frost talking about the Wyoming um, Craton. So uh, that's gonna be, he's a great speaker and that should be a fantastic talk. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you back here in two weeks. <laughs>